So I am just so happy that she is here, and um, I will turn her introduction over to Kathy Cannon's hands. Thank you, Margo. It is truly my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker here at our awards luncheon. Uh, Dr. Barbara Babcock is the first woman uh, regularly appointed to the professorship at Stanford University, and she continues to work there today. She's nationally recognized and been awarded for her work in particular in the research of women in the law. She also is internationally well known now because she's traveling around the world with this new book, this wonderful book that I am eager to read and I just got over there at that table from her and her staff, The Trials of Clara Fultz, Woman Lawyer. Clara Fultz being the first public defender um, and the first woman attorney in the state of California. And in her footsteps walked Dar Dr. Barbara Babcock. She was the first woman professor at Stanford. She was the first public defender in Washington, D.C., and the first uh, director of defender services in Washington, D.C. So hail, hail to women coming along nicely in the field of law. Later, she became the Assistant Attorney General in Civil Rights at the US, uh, United States Department of Justice. And we are here in particular to honor her for her work in the research of women and women in the law, but in particular this wonderful book about one of our founding pioneers, Dr. Barbara, Barbara Babcock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. These, um, these days I see most things uh, through the eyes of Clara Foltz, and I can't really think of any group that could be assembled that would give her as much satisfaction and pleasure as this one that I'm looking at, at now. A whole room full of people devoted to the challenge of public defense. And, it's a, and, and I feel the same way, I must say. I always feel like I'm with my people when I come and talk to defenders, because as you've heard, I've done quite a few things in my career, but the most salient years were, the, were those that I spent um, at the Public Defender in Washington, D.C., both as a staff attorney um, and, a, um, uh, and, and as uh, the first director of it. Um, and um, as Margot will we'll tell you, um, I, I have the stories, my, my most important stories um, are all from those public defender days. It's especially appropriate that we meet in San Jose, where Clara Foltz lived when she first joined the bar and found her first support for the ideas uh, of civil rights for women and constitutional rights for the criminally accused. Today I want to talk about her ideas, uh, the, the ideas that she had. It wasn't just a vague suggestion, uh, uh, her conception of the public defender. In fact, it was in no way superficial or general. She made strong, analytic, and passionate arguments about the need for such an office. And many of these arguments hold true today. And Clara Foltz did a lot more than talk about it, though she, uh, though she talked a lot about it. Uh, she, she wrote about it and published in the prestigious law reviews, the most prestigious law reviews in the country. She drafted a public defender statute, and she lobbied for it uh, and, and uh, saw to its passage in 13 states um, in, uh, it, uh, in 1896. Now, who was Clara Foltz? She was the first woman lawyer in California. She was one of the first in the entire company, a country. The opening chapter of the book tells the story of how in 1878, she got the code section providing that only white men of good character could be lawyers. And she got that changed to make it all persons of good character. Uh, thus opening the bar to minority groups uh, as well as to women. But the fight 
was all about women joining the bar, and it was a terrific fight to get it uh, passed. She uh, did get the, get the code changed uh, to make all persons eligible, and then she was the first to take advantage of the statute and join the bar to nationwide publicity, dubbing her the Portia of the Pacific. In 1879, she tried to attend the first law school in the state, but Hastings rejected her because she was a woman. Apparently, she argued, uh, the board of directors believed that women could be lawyers, but they shouldn't learn the law. <laughs> she, she successfully sued the school and lobbied through a constitutional amendment providing that women could pursue any vocation or calling and that the public schools in California would be open to both sexes. But in the end, by the time she won her case in the California Supreme Court, opening the doors of Hastings to women, uh, she, had, uh, she was too busy practicing law to learn it uh, at that point. And she always regretted um, her, her imperfect education, as she called it. The second chapter of the book tells of her efforts to make a living. And it was mainly these efforts, uh, from these efforts, that she invented, created, pioneered, and designed the public defender, and to which the last chapter, the triumphant chapter of the book, is dedicated. One of the fundamental underlying questions in the whole book is this. How did an uneducated, she had only two years of formal schooling, single mother of five, practicing law in the far west long before women had political equality, come up with this idea, an entirely new way to practice law, and how did she promote it? That's the main uh, subject of my talk today. When Clara Foltz started out, it was very hard uh, to uh, make a living as a lawyer for most people. Uh, it, any, uh, especially for those who didn't have independent wealth or family connections. Th for Clara Foltz, who had no choice but to hang, hang out her shingle alone, it proved impossible in the early days of her practice to attract paying clients. Instead, she helped dependent women obtain divorces, and she represented poor people charged with crime. Now, at least with the divorce cases in those days, there was a chance of a fee if they could win a property settlement. But only the most destitute criminals were desperate enough to turn to a woman lawyer. In fact, many of Foltz's criminal clients did not choose her, but received her services by appointment of the court. Throughout the United States, this was the usual method of providing lawyers in the 19th century for those unable to pay. In a few very progressive states, courts had held that these appointed lawyers should be paid from the public treasury. But these precedents were rejected in California the year before Clara joined the bar, so that service uh, by coin court appointment for the indigent accused was uh, considered a professional duty and obligation uh, uh, by the bar. Foltz described the result of the appointed counsel system. She said, the appointees come from the failures of the profession, who hang about courts hoping for a stray dollar or two from the unfortunate, or from the kindergartens of the profession, just let loose from school and anxious to learn the practice. If the accused or his family had a little money, he might fall into the hands of a shyster lawyer who would take every last quarter for little or nothing in return. Even those defendants who could afford adequate counsel were often, often financially